I think the story is all about us. We are special in the universe. We are conscious and aware and inquisitive and curious. And that is definitely a very, very rare thing in the universe. If it were common, we would have met our alien neighbors by now. So there is something special about us. There is something special about the Earth. There is something unique about our planet and our situation and our ability to ask questions about the universe. And I think ultimately, inquiring about the universe is inquiring about us. We are trying to explore our own nature and our own origins and our own place in the universe. And by studying the universe more, we are coming to a greater understanding of ourselves. Today, I'm pleased to be in companion of Paul M. Sutter. He is an astrophysicist, science educator, and science communicator. He hosts several podcasts and a YouTube series, consults for television and film productions, has published in popular science journals, and gives public lectures on physics and astronomy. He is the author of two books, Your Place in the Universe and How to Die in Space, two really recommended reads, and he received his PhD on physics from the University of Illinois in 2011. How are you, Paul? Welcome to the show. I am doing fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on. You are an astrophysicist, so you know quite a bit about the physics, I guess. <laughs> yes, my, my PhD, which I earned in 2011, is in physics, but my specialty is astrophysics and cosmology. Perfect. How much of physics is about knowing the formulas and how much of it is understanding, knowing the formulas in comparison to knowing the concepts of physics? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because physics is a mathematical description of nature. It is through the lens of mathematics that physicists are able to understand how nature works. It is how we can make predictions. It is how we can understand phenomena. It is just how we do things. And so the formulas themselves aren't necessarily a matter of memorization, but it's a matter of translation. It's about thinking in a mathematical way. It's about using mathematics to represent fundamental concepts that we are trying to grapple with and use to model the world that we find ourselves in. Okay, so you would say that it is fundamental to understand the formulas in a deep level, at a mathematical level, in order to be able to understand physics in a more general way. Exactly, exactly. And it's not just a matter of memorization. I have rarely memorized one particular equation or formula, but it's about thinking in that mathematical way and getting used to the idea of using mathematics to represent nature. Okay. I have a stupid question that I would like to ask you. Why are there multiple forces that describe how matter interacts with itself? My intuition tells me that there's no actual need for multiple forces to describe how matter interacts with itself. There would be no need for that. Why do four different forces exist? That is a very fun and deep, deep question because... Ultimately, we don't know why the universe is the way it is. Why do we have this variety of particles? Why do they have these kinds of interactions? Why is there a force of gravity and electromagnetism and weak nuclear and strong nuclear? Are there more forces of nature that we have yet to discover and so on? It's hoped that ultimately, someday in the future, we can develop a so-called theory of everything that is able to explain why we have this particular universe and not a different kind of universe. But we don't know if we'll ever develop a theory of everything. And the reason that we describe nature using different forces is because we view a variety of different interactions. So if I drop a ball it falls to the ground. And I see this phenomenon, I call it gravity, and I develop a theory of how gravity works. But if I electrically charge that ball, if I make it made out of metal, and then I electrically charge it, and I put a magnet on the floor, the ball behaves differently. 
And I need a different set of equations of mathematics to describe that because I have a completely different phenomenon now that I'm dealing with that has nothing to do with gravity. And so observations force us to explain the universe using different fundamental forces and combinations of those forces. We have discovered through our work in high energy theoretical physics that at a very high energies, the forces of nature do merge together. So for example, we have the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force In normal everyday situations, these forces look and act completely differently. The electromagnetic force is responsible for radiation and electricity and magnetism. And the weak nuclear force is responsible for radioactive decay. And at first glance, these have absolutely nothing to do with each other. But we have discovered at a certain energy, these two forces merge together into a single unified force. And we suspect that at incredibly high energies, all the forces of nature merge together into a single unified force. Uh, But we don't know what that is. And there was a split, wasn't it? Just after the Big Bang. Exactly. In the very earliest moments of the Big Bang in the early universe, we do believe that all the forces in nature were merged together, and that very quickly, in a matter of the tiniest fraction of a second, those four forces split off from each other. And one of the ways in which nature forces its rules into us as conscious entities is the conservation of mass and energy. Well, Mass and energy energy are equated, as Einstein, I think, discovered. But I would like to know what is one of the most tricky and sneaky ways in which nature forces conservation of energy ultimately to how much energy you have? Yeah, so conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, uh, concepts like this are at the absolute cornerstone of our modern understanding of physics. The concept of conservation of momentum, for example, underlies every single theory of physics. So, and we don't normally think of theories of physics or the formulas that you might have learned or the equations you might have learned as expressing conservation of momentum, but it really is like every single physical theory, every modern theory is ultimately derived from basic concepts like conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. So if you think of the wildest situation in physics, if you think of the wildest thing that we observe in nature, like radioactive decay, like the expansion of the universe itself, like the birth and death of stars, all of that is understood through a lens that starts with conservation of momentum and energy. But there's an exception there. In your book, Your Place in the Universe, you talk in one chapter, I don't remember now which one specifically, about how dark energy doesn't rule itself by the rules of conservation of energy in that there's a sneaky way in which it's infinite in a sense, expands itself. And so is there any way we could use this to avoid the eventual heat death of the universe by reversing entropy indefinitely using the seemingly existing loophole that exists in physics in relation to dark energy, as you mentioned? So when it comes to dark energy, dark energy is the observed accelerated expansion of the universe. And one of the curious things about dark energy, which we do not fully understand, we do not know what is causing the accelerated expansion. We have a cool name for it, dark energy. If dark energy is somehow related to the vacuum of space-time, which we suspect it might be, it has this curious property that it accelerates the expansion of the universe. This gives you more universe. The volume of the universe is physically larger, which gives you more dark energy, which causes more acceleration, which gives you more universe, which gives you more dark energy, and so on and so on. So at first glance, it appears to be violating conservation of energy because there is literally more dark energy being created every single day. But we have to be careful with statements about conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. And this is highlighted by the difference between just saying a concept like 
energy is conserved, and actually writing down the mathematical expression of that same concept, which is much more rigorously defined and much more narrowly defined than the natural language words we might use to describe it. So the existence of dark energy and the accelerated expansion of the universe does not violate conservation of energy. You might think it does, but that's because we're using a very limited language, in this case, the English language, to describe the concept. But when we break down the actual mathematics behind it, we see that what's happening is that conservation of energy as we typically understand it, which is that energy cannot be created or destroyed— only applies in isolated systems. When you have a dynamic, evolving system, in this case, we live in in a dynamic, evolving universe, a universe that is constantly expanding already, you can get situations that appear to be violations of conservation of energy, but When you balance everything up, when you add everything together, when you include the actual dynamics of the system in the mathematics, you see that everything is fine. So dark energy isn't really cheating. It's not really a loophole. And unfortunately, there is no way to put dark energy to any useful amount of work. God damn it. I thought we had a a loophole to solve the heat death of the universe, but it seems like we don't. Unfortunately, no. Okay, I will have to keep thinking. I will not think of it. I, I will have to accept nihilism as the correct philosophy. Above iron, in density terms, fission gives off energy. Below it, fusion does. Could you please explain how this works? Yeah, so uh, like you mentioned, when you take light elements together, like hydrogen or oxygen or silicon, and smash them together you create a heavier element. Uh, But the total mass of that element that you've just made, like if I take two hydrogen atoms and smash them together, I get helium. The mass of that helium atom is a little bit less than the total mass of the original two hydrogen atoms that you started with. And so that difference in mass gets released as an energy, and we get that through E equals mc squared. And so when you fuse light elements together, you end up with heavier and heavier elements, but the sum of that is less than the total mass of your original components, and so you get a little bit of energy output from that reaction. At iron, that game stops, and that game stops because of the unique atomic structure of iron itself. Every nucleus is made of both protons and neutrons. And once you reach a tipping point of the arrangement of protons and neutrons inside the nucleus of the atom, then smashing heavier elements together, if I take two iron atoms, for example, and smash them together, I do get a heavier element. I can do fusion. It's totally possible. But because of the combination of protons and neutrons inside the nucleus of that new heavier element, I don't get any energy out of the reaction. I can do it. It just takes energy. And it really just all comes down to how the protons and neutrons interact with each other in an atomic nucleus. There is going to be a tipping point somewhere, and it turned out to be at the element of iron. I see iron as the lowest point in a ballet in which it's surrounded by two sides that are higher in terms of energy, and you can move one in the distribution of the elements in density terms. You can move to one side and derive energy, potential energy, and convert it into, in this analogy, to cinetic energy, transferring the element towards iron, aumenting the density from the ones that are lower in density, as you really well explained, towards the lowest point in this hypothetical ballet that I'm explaining. And then from the other side, the ones that are more dense, you can take them back down to iron, but that's the place in which all the matter ultimately we'll end up when we transition. Maybe you can let me know what's the time frame in which most or all the matter in the universe will be converted into iron? 
Exactly. So over extremely long time scales, eventually matter devolves into iron and then eventually the iron itself just slowly decays away. Uh, We are talking hundreds of trillions of years for that process to play out. So for some perspective, our universe is about 13.8 billion years old. So we are talking thousands, hundreds of thousands of times longer than the current age of the universe for that kind of process to play out. We're now talking about 10 to the ninth power in terms of how long the existence of the universe has been. 13 billion years is more or less nine orders of magnitude, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So 10 to the ninth and then uh, trillions of years are 10 to the 12th power. So we still have like a thousand or more than a thousand times more time left in terms of not being surrounded by exclusively iron. Exactly. Was the matter existing one second after the Big Bang fully composed of hydrogen? One second after the Big Bang, it was the entire universe was actually in a state, a very exotic state that was not yet in the form of atomic nuclei and electrons. It was actually in the state that we call a quark gluon plasma. So the densities and temperatures of the universe in that epoch were so high and fundamental particles were crashing into each other at such an enormous rate that atomic nuclei themselves couldn't even exist because as soon as one formed, then it would get smashed to pieces. So the universe was made of a mix of the fundamental components of atomic nuclei, which are the building blocks of protons and neutrons, which we call the quarks. And the forces that mediate, or the force that mediates the strong nuclear force are called gluons. These are the carriers of the strong nuclear force. We just have a mix of quarks and gluons. It would actually take about 10 to 20 minutes into the history of the universe after the Big Bang for the first atomic nuclei to appear. And the speed at which temperature was reduced, I guess, it was a couple of orders of magnitude per millisecond at the first instant. Something like that. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Are you able of making sense of superior spatial dimensions, like the fourth dimension? I watched the video of you explaining the limits of the universe and whatever you consider to be outside of the universe is itself a thing. And whenever you think of something as being a thing, it's by definition part of the universe. So unless you are able to think, you explain that great analogy about two dimensions, and then we perceive our world in three dimensions. So you're able to separate yourself away from the two dimensions with the third one that we are able to manage. But now the fourth one would be the only one in which we could get away from the third dimensional universe. But my brain maybe is too primitive, or I don't know what, but I'm not able to make any sense at all about a fourth dimension. Oh, yeah, neither could I. can I. A fourth spatial dimension, I cannot visualize it. Some people claim they can. I think they're lying. Uh, I, I think three spatial dimensions is wired into our brains from the moment of our birth. It's part of our evolutionary heritage. We've only ever lived in a universe with three spatial dimensions. We can see two spatial dimensions. I can look at a piece of paper and draw lines on a piece of paper. I can see one dimension, but seeing and visualizing four spatial dimensions, I truly believe is impossible. But this is the power of mathematics because it's possible for us to use mathematics to go beyond what even our imaginations are limited by because with mathematics, we can write down and grapple with and use higher dimensional spaces, even though they can't be visualized. I see physics and mathematics as the fields of knowledge in which the most orders of magnitude are concerned. And we are not evolutionarily, I think, developed to conceive so many orders of magnitude in a way that makes sense to us. Our instinct, our neurotransmitters that is ultimately the thing that makes us feel consciousness is made up of interactions between neurons the way our evolution made us is not designed to make us perceive with our feelings those absurd amount of orders of magnitude 
So in, in your place in the universe, you mentioned, quote, apparently that unification happened only once for a brief moment when the universe was less than 10 to the minus 36 powers, seconds and smaller than a single electron. The words brief and small in the preceding sentence seem hopelessly inadequate, but here we are, unquote. Is your calibration of how inadequate words small and brief itself calibrated? Are you giving a correct representation of how inadequate it is by saying that it is hopelessly inadequate? Is there any way of doing enough meta-analysis so that we can represent anything astrophysical correctly? Oh, yeah. And I think what I was pointing out in that passage, and it's one of my favorite things to highlight, and we've already encountered it in this interview, is how sometimes human language can not fully encapsulate and describe the scales of size or distance or energy that we are talking about here. And that this is why mathematics is so powerful because it allows us to put a number on it. It allows us to model it. Mathematics allows us to develop mathematical theories that we can then use to make predictions and the predictions agree with experiments and with observations. So we know we're doing something right even if we don't have the language ability to properly describe the mathematics themselves. Instead, we use mathematics as the language to describe nature, not as a companion to natural language, but as the language. A Galileo himself said that the book of nature is written in mathematical characters, and that is something that physicists continue to use to view the universe. Okay, I get it, but we are condemned to seeing concepts or feeling them in a synthetic, and we are separated from them absolutely because our feedback system is not aligned with that. So I think that in the same way that when you get into your car and you press the gas pedal, you don't feel how much energy is being consumed per second. But if you were driving a bike, you would instantly know that you are spending a huge amount of energy. So you're internal feedback system tells you, hey, stop this. We are designed to avoid any energy expenditure because that's evolutionarily selected for. But with the car, that doesn't happen because it's an external system that's mechanical and technologically advanced. It's the outcome of technological progress in the same way that mathematics or physics, I think, is. This is my perception. You cannot feel as intensely or with the same kind of feelings how big the universe is as you would, for example, the increase in a few inches of your apartment. When you come from a super small apartment and then you increase it a bit, you feel the increase in space. There's no way of feeling that same amount of space added to the universe each millisecond as a way of, maybe this is too metaphorical. I feel like we are separated from it in a super abstract and synthetic way. It is true. Like, I understand that sentiment that it feels abstract, it feels synthetic, it feels artificial. But the entire point of training as a scientist, and especially training as a physicist, is to develop a comfortable intuition with the mathematics. So that when we are grappling with these concepts, they do not feel artificial. They do not feel alien. They feel second nature. They feel like if you've never spoken French before, and then I dropped you into the middle of Paris, France, things would feel very alien and foreign and artificial because you may recognize some of the patterns and the behaviors, but you you don't understand what is being communicated to you. But if you start to learn French, and if you live in France and spend more time in France, then over time, things become more natural. They become more familiar. They become intuitive. You get a sense of how French people live and work and communicate with each other, and you become a part of that. And so physics can be alienating. It really can. But it's not alienating to physicists themselves because this is how we construct our view of the universe. If the universe is 13.8 billion years, as you said before, how is it that the diameter of the observable universe is more than 13.8 billion light years? I think that 
that must be an extrapolation because we could not see the universe as being more than 13.8 billion light years in diameter. I think it's 93, I have noted here, but isn't that an extrapolation of what we expect the current location of the galaxies to be on in relation to the speed and expected increase in the speed at which they are separating, that we can conceive it as being 93 billion light years across when the universe is itself only 13.8 billion years? Right. Yeah, exactly. So we know that the universe is perfectly capable of expanding faster than the speed of light. And we have a model, we have an understanding of the history of expansion of the universe. We can get at this through theory, and we can also get it at it through direct observation. So if we look at a distant, distant galaxy at the edge of the observable universe, we can measure directly how quickly it is receding away from us at this very moment or at the moment when the light left that galaxy. And then we can look at all the galaxies between us and that distant edge and see how quickly they are receding away from us. And from there, we can build up a map of the expansion history of the universe. And that's how we are able to get the total size of the universe. It's like sampling a bunch of cars on a freeway with how fast they are going. And by measuring how quickly they're going, you can get the total length of the road. And so we know that our universe is about 93 to 95 billion light years across, even though it has only existed for 13.8 billion years. You have an analogy in your book, Your Place in the Universe to represent the hugeness, the absolute mind-bogglingly hugeness of the universe. In this part, you only talk about the galaxy, but I will read it to the audience just so they, they can hear it. Were you to put the Earth a scant three feet away from the sun, in an analogy, Proxima Centauri would be 200 miles away. The Milky Way galaxy itself is around 100,000 light years across. Simple math reveals that you could fit 25,000 Sun Proxima distances across its breadth. In our scale model, with the Sun 3 feet away from Earth and Proxima 200 miles away from that, the Milky Way in its entirety would stretch 5 million miles, which would put the edge about 20 times farther than the Moon. I think this is just mind-bogglingly. I don't know how big the Milky Way is in relationship to the absolute universe, what's exactly the percentage that our Milky Way, maybe you don't know the exact number, but the Milky Way, I think it's 105,000 light years across, if I didn't get that number wrong. And the universe is, as you said, uh, 93 billion light years across. So that percentage, it's just so mind-bogglingly big. Oh, yeah, the universe is gigantic. We can write down numbers for it, but, but trying to express it, I come up short every single time. It's amazing. When I read that in your book, Your Place in the Universe, that you put the sun three feet away the Earth in a three-dimensional representation here on Earth, Proxima Centauri would be 200 miles away. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Space is big, and it's bigger than we can possibly imagine. It's bigger than we can really comprehend. We're almost used to talking about solar system scales by now of sending spacecraft and it will take the better part of a decade to reach the outer solar system. We're, we're used to talking on those length scales, but going anything beyond our solar system, it just doesn't make sense. Okay. What do you mean by it turns out that the efforts of generations of scientists over the course of centuries have barely even scrapped the cosmological surface? How much do we know that we do not know? We do not know the vast majority of the universe. The vast majority of the universe, over 99% of its volume, has not been mapped in any significant way. And we know that 95% of the contents of the universe are of a form that are currently unknown to physics. We call these two components dark matter and dark energy together together. They make up 95% of the universe, and we don't know what they are. We know that they exist, but we don't know what they are. And so we have been working for centuries of understanding physics and electromagnetic radiation and the force of gravity and uh, atomic structure and all that. It turns out that that explains 
less than 5% of the universe. And so it's a very exciting time to be here because we have these grand mysteries that confront us and we get to be the ones to try to answer them. So there's still hope left in terms of being a useful human. Absolutely. Okay. There's a term you use in your book called blue shift, a phenomenon that occurs when something is coming towards us. The opposite is redshift, when something is going away from us, if I didn't get that wrong. How can you estimate the speed at which a galaxy is moving through space if that's only the relative speed between the speed at which you're moving and the speed at which that thing is moving? How can you discount your own speed? Well, all motion that we ascribe to stars and distant galaxies is relative to us. And so those numbers are all relative to us, which is what matters because we're the ones doing the observation. Okay. So you don't discount it. You simply assume it. Exactly. Okay, perfect. It seems to me that we are cosmologically lucky to be able to, one, perceive the expansion of the universe and the existence of dark matter, and two, perceive the existence of other galaxies. This makes me think of a somewhat unfalsifiable thought. What if, in the same way that we are lucky to perceive the aforementioned, we are not in terms of life, because we are too late in the party to perceive life apart from us, just barely to its rarity? Maybe, in the same way that we wouldn't have been able to perceive the other galaxies 10 times in the lifespan of the universe, if you multiply that by 10, you wouldn't be able to see any galaxies. I don't know if I got the time frame correctly. What if the reason why we don't see any life is just because we are too late in the development of the universe? Yeah, it, that's a big unknown question. We do not know how common life is in the universe. As far as we can tell, we are alone, but we've barely scratched the surface in terms of ob observing and finding evidence for life, uh, intelligent or otherwise. We just don't know how common or rare life is. And that's as much as we can say based on the evidence. I'm one of the most skeptical people in terms of religion and, and spiritual things. But when it comes to the alignment or the fine-tuning of the universe, I just have to fall into some kind of believing. Because why is it that everything is so damn fine-tuned in the universe to permit our existence? From the gravitational constant being adjusted to 1 in 10 to the 60th power, to the cosmological constant being adjusted to 1 in 10 to the 120th power away from not permitting our existence. And these are just two examples. This is extremely fine-tuned. How do you make sense of this? Honestly, we don't know. And one possible response to that is, sure, the universe appears fine-tuned for us in our kind of life, and our kind of intelligence. But if you were to play with any of those fundamental constants, you would get a different kind of universe, and maybe a different kind of life would appear in that universe, something that we can't even fathom right now because we're not used to working with that kind of fundamental physics. And they would develop consciousness, and they would begin observing the universe, and then they would ask the exact same question about why is the universe so fine-tuned for life, when really they are just finding themselves in a universe fine-tuned for their kind of life and their kind of consciousness. So if the universe were different, who knows if life would be possible or if consciousness would be possible, and who knows if we would be asking the same question. I see an analogy here with history. We have an inspector bias. It couldn't be otherwise that we are perceiving a super perfectly aligned thing that makes our existence possible. We look back at our cultural revolutions and every single bit of history seems to point out to us. It couldn't be otherwise. We wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case. So I think that we are biased by the inspector bias and we cannot count how common life is. How will you start reasoning about this. When it comes to the possibility of life outside the Earth, the way to reason about it is to make as many observations as possible. We are hunting for signs of life in our own solar system. The James Webb Space Telescope, one of its missions is to hunt for signs of life in exoplanet atmospheres. We can listen for potential radio signals or look for techno signatures. 
it's a matter of data now, and it's a matter of observation and a matter of really hard work. Could you please elaborate a bit over how randomly we stumbled upon the cosmic microwave background and how important it is to sustain a thesis that the Big Bang is an actual thing? Yeah, back in the 1950s, the Big Bang Theory was already becoming generally widely accepted. There were already some pieces of evidence in favor for the fact that our universe in the past was smaller and hotter. And there was a group of theoretical physicists based at Harvard who were exploring the consequences of this idea, and they realized that at some point in the past history of the universe— Our universe was so small, it was hot enough and dense enough for it to be in the state of a plasma. And then as the universe expanded from that state, the plasma would have cooled off and become a neutral gas and released a form of radiation. And that radiation would just float throughout the universe, hanging out and still exists today, except that radiation would be a lot cooler and have a lot longer wavelength than when it first formed. And they were actually in the process, this team at Harvard, were in the process of developing a instrument to go and detect this radiation, which they believed was in the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Unbeknownst to them, down in New Jersey, a couple of engineers were developing a microwave antenna for Bell Labs, and they built these antenna, and then they found this background hiss that they couldn't get rid of, this background signal that they just couldn't get rid of, and they spent months trying to get rid of it, and they just couldn't. They reached out to the scientific community to see if there's any possible explanation, and they were introduced to this Harvard team, and the Harvard team realized that these two engineers, Penzias and Wilson, had accidentally discovered the thing that the Harvard team was going out to try to discover. And so we call this remnant radiation the cosmic microwave background. There's no alternate theory of the history of the universe that is able to explain the existence of the cosmic microwave background. This is one of the many reasons that the Big Bang Theory is believed to be largely correct, is because there's this massive piece of evidence just sitting there in the sky. Were theories prior to the discovery of the cosmic microwave background predicting the Big Bang or the cosmic microwave background in a way that When we discovered it, someone said, hey, I was predicting this, and now we found it. Yes, that's exactly right. So the team at Harvard had predicted the existence of the cosmic microwave background, and were in the process of developing a microwave observatory to go looking for it when they found out that these two engineers had already discovered it accidentally. Oh, wow. That's so amazing. What do you think? What is life? Oh, that's impossible to define. I think there are over 200 different definitions of what life is. And this is going outside my specialty as a physicist, but many view life as a set of molecular interactions that are able to store information and replicate themselves and be subject to the process of Darwinian evolution. Mm. The definition I love that I've heard that I like the most is life is information modifying matter. What do you think of that? I don't really have many thoughts on that statement. I know that there are a lot of discussions about the role of information in terms of life and complexity and physics and biophysics, but that's so far outside of my specialty that that's the extent of my thoughts on it. Okay. What can you make out of the extreme fragility of our biology? of that of the rest of living beings and our ephemeral nature. In your book, How to Die in Space, you drown readers in ways in which space is not friendly to our biology. When I was listening to your place in the universe, I was like, oh wow, this is just so fucking hostile. There's no way our biology could survive in outer space. Do you have any thoughts about how we could compatibilize interstellar human 
colony or you know human life we are robust we are adaptable we are pretty strong but we're highly adapted to the environment that we evolved in and space is definitely the most radical environment that a human can possibly be exposed to and it's not a matter of adaptation for a human to be able to survive on their own for long periods of time in space, I don't know if they would even be recognizably human anymore. So it's more of a matter of bringing our habitat with us and building our own habitats in space or on the surfaces of other planets so that we can continue to live in the environment to which we are most well adapted. Okay. What do you think is the solution to the Fermi paradox? I know that you are not a fan at all of the Drake equation. I think you believe that the Drake equation only shows our ignorance. So how will you start arguing about the Fermi paradox? What are your intuitions there? I believe that the Fermi paradox is not a paradox. I think the Fermi paradox exposes the fundamental human limitations when it comes to addressing truly interstellar concepts. Without any evidence whatsoever, I do believe that we are not alone in the universe, that there are other intelligent civilizations out there. But the reason that we can't find them, that we can't talk to them, is because the scales of time and space in our universe are so vast and so grand that we are effectively alone, that we will never hear from someone or see evidence for someone because the universe is just too big and life is just too rare. And so I don't believe that the Fermi paradox is a problem, but rather the fact that it is perfectly possible for life to be relatively common in the universe, but for the universe to still be so enormously big and so incredibly old that all those pockets of life are essentially disconnected from each other. Oh, wow. Okay. So you don't believe in great filters? Uh, no, I don't think they're necessary. I don't think it's necessary to introduce exotic solutions to the Fermi paradox because I believe it's not a paradox in the first place. So you believe it is just a, a game of numbers? I think it's, we need to reset our conceptions of space and time outside of the historical norms and our limited worldviews. And once we expand our way of thinking to truly interstellar distances, where signals take thousands of years to go from one star to another, where sending a craft is mind-bogglingly difficult and ridiculously energy expensive, where things just operate on a different scale that is not compatible with the human way of thinking. How would that expansion of our mindset begin? By just thinking big. Just start by thinking big and realizing that everything is bigger and everything is slower than you could possibly imagine. I'd like to hear what your thoughts are about the following quote. We became self-aware only to realize this story is not about us. Uh, I don't know. I think the story is all about us. We are special in the universe. We are conscious and aware and inquisitive and curious. And that is definitely a very, very rare thing in the universe. If it were common, we would have met our alien neighbors by now. So there is something special about us. There is something special about the Earth. There is something unique about our planet and our situation and our ability to ask questions about the universe. And I think ultimately inquiring about the universe is inquiring about us. We are trying to explore our own nature and our own origins and our own place in the universe. And by studying the universe more, we are coming to a greater understanding of ourselves. So you believe that the meaning of life can be found in a self-fulfilling prophecy way? I feel like we get to create our own meaning of life. But the fact of believing that there's meaning, meaning appears. Exactly. I love it. In the, your place in the universe, you finished it by saying that we don't exactly know how the universe started, neither how it's going to end, but at least there is symmetry. Uh, yes. I, I loved it. At least we are surrounded by ignorance, which gives us an opportunity to play with our curiosity. 
I recommend everyone to check your books on Amazon at Paul M. Sutter, Your Place in the Universe and How to Die in Space. Where can people find more about you, Paul? Oh, the best way to follow me is on social media, which is at Paul Matt Sutter on all social channels. And then also my website, pmsutter.com, that always has links to all my latest projects. Perfect. I will leave the links to your... I will leave those logs in the show notes just below the, this episode. Fantastic. Thank you. It's been an absolute astonishingly great experience to be able to talk to an astrophysicist. This doesn't happen to me every day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you again for having me on.